Hello, Guilty Feminist, it's Deborah. Just letting you know this is another crossover episode. We have teamed up with our friends at All Killer No Filler to bring you All Killer No Feminism, an exciting crossover mashup episode. Also, the Guilty Feminist Classic with me, Deborah Frances White, and some mega guests will be in New York City at Gramercy Theatre on the 4th of January 2020. But tickets are going fast. There aren't many left. So go to guiltyfeminist.com ASAP and click the link under live shows to get yours now. And now on with the podcast. All killer, no feminism. I'm a feminist, but I had a fantasy that Lizzo was my friend. (laughs) But in it, I just agreed with everything she said because she's so much cooler than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, ever, was she like being really racist and you're like, yeah, I think that as well? Would you just go along with anything? It was just a daydream where I went, all you would do if you were her friend would be to go, yeah. <laughs> and I thought this would not be a fun friendship for her. Also, it's your daydream. Make it what you want. You've ruined it for yourself there. I know. <laughs> I know that's very much the point of the I'm a feminist it's, part. It's, it's, not even, it's not even a... A dream that you've got. Not, it's literally you just going, oh, I'm going to think about it. Look, I can bang Liam Gallagher whenever I want, mate. <laughs> but are you never low status in your own fantasies or your own... I can you... tell you now she's fucking not. <laughs> <laughs> not low status anywhere. Like, do you imagine sort of like meeting some like pin up or somebody fabulous or whatever and you're chatting to them in the chat? Are you always like on top of it and super sassy? Yeah, we're having a good time. We're getting on. I, I have these little, yeah, I think things like that. All the time. You think, oh, I bet me and that person would get on and you have a little think about it. And then you're like, yeah. You're and then you Google their name on. and super injunction and they're not, I don't think they would get on. <laughs> you see their name trending on Twitter and think, oh. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but when I go to a football match and there's a really good atmosphere and everyone's really like, yeah, shouting and cheering and stuff, and I hear a female voice going, go on, Aguero, go wide, go wide. I'm like, no. (laughs) (laughs) I feel so much better about being a little low status to Lizzo now. I think you might have eased me into my one, which is (laughs) the reason I was like, you you go first. (laughs) I'm a feminist, but I'm obsessed with true crime, which means I spend a disproportionate amount of time worrying about being abducted. And most of that worry is, how will they describe my body type? (laughs) If it's hefty, throw my bones in the sea. (laughs) I'm a feminist, but for years, I had a Playboy bunny diamante necklace because I thought it gave me an edgy, sexy recklessness. Uh, Guilty of that also. (laughs) And all it gave you was a green mark on your skin. (laughs) (laughs) I'm a feminist, but when I hear plans to bring the retirement age of women to the same as men, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. (laughs) This equality thing's getting out of hand. (laughs) Not on my watch. Not for me. Mm. I'm a feminist, but I insist on ironing my male friends and family shirts, claiming that I can do it better. (laughs) I have ruined eight shirts. Love. Do you want a glass of water? You sure? Oh, don't, I, don't stifled a, it down. You, you're right. Get that pint down, you. You're all right. You sure. Yeah. That's the spirit. I think we've got our first oh, murder. Just, uh, our get... first murder to solve is in the front row. Can I just say this lady has pulled a bottle of water out of a lovely all killer no filler tote bag? Yeah. yeah. Is it an all killer no filler tote bag? Yeah. yeah. Oh. It's got our faces on it. No, don't apologise. No, I followed no, it's someone. Fine. Uh, two bus stops longer than I should have because I saw one and I was like that's my face and they were like okay 
So exciting. Did I love you it. follow do you follow people yeah. who carry your merch? No, not all. And always. try and get their peripheral vision. Um yeah, and yeah. hope they recognise you. No, because usually I look like shit and nothing like even a cartoon of me. So I'm like, please don't see me now. And be like, that looks like a fat, tired version of Kiri pritchard McLean. Well, do you know what? When I feel I look like that, when I go out of the house like that and someone does recognise me, I get really upset. Yeah. Because I think, how do you think I look like this <laughs> when all of my press shots are so very glamorous? Yes. So I'm like, they just go, oh, you're Deborah Francis White from The Guilty Feminist. And I'm like, but I look like a really bad version of that. So don't assume that. They could have uh, some kind of like eyesight problem though. So they're looking at you through a soft focus. Oh, they're looking at me through rose colored glasses, yes. babe. I, mean, I think that's <laughs> very clearly the case. I uh, realized a couple of months ago, I was like, I really like it when people come up to me and talk to me about the podcast and go, oh, I love your podcast. And I'm like, yeah, brilliant. I love this, mate. This is great. I should be mega famous because I'm a brilliant famous person. Uh, <laughs> but I realized it was happening in the pub all the time. Because I kept saying, got recognised in the pub. And I'm like, I'm spending too much time in the pub. Uh, that I was like, this is the issue. This is the issue. Happened to be last night in the pub. <laughs> See, I normally get recognised at feminist rallies. <laughs> Marches, protests. Really? For me, it's orgies. You wouldn't believe. <laughs> you wouldn't believe. <laughs> oh, those with, with the models. Those orgies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. With all the I'm too scared to go anything to anything like killing kittens now. Um, do you guys know what killing kittens is? <laughs> It's not true crime. Uh, it's a sex sort of event. A sex event? Yeah, it's a sex event. It's <laughs> so Alan Partridge. <laughs> Sonia, we're having a sex event. <laughs> it's, not, it's not what they... They don't market it that way. Oh, my God, they're going to call me and say, please stop describing us. Um, it's a sex event. Uh, they have them up the top of, like, penthouses and stuff. And everyone dresses up and everyone wears masks and it's all very glamorous and only women can approach. Women can approach women, women can approach men, men can't approach anybody. Excellent. Perfect. As they should be in yeah. life. But isn't. Yeah. And uh, Posh Bumble. Yeah. <laughs> but posh 3D live in the room bumble. Lovely. Yeah. But everyone wears masks. But you can at some point take the mask off because they are a bit annoying, I think. I hear. <laughs> um, but now I think I don't want someone coming up to me and going. I love your podcast. Can I have a selfie when I've just got like my tits out? Oh yeah. Has that? Surely just keep the mask on. They're not going to go. I could recognise those tits. <laughs> I mean, I think you feasibly could if you follow me in every kind of situation. <laughs> to be fair, but I think it's my voice. People know a lot because yeah. uh, some... type down. <laughs> How do you hit on someone without saying anything though? I have a I do like a bane distorter. <laughs> It's not going to make me feel sexy. I suppose I could do an accent. Yes. Think of it as character work. Yes. Yeah. I, I... I feel that sex party, I keep thinking about it, I, I feel like that kind of sex party would just bring out the worst bit of the working class in me. <laughs> I'd be like, why do we have to do this in a fucking penthouse? <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd be like, we're not doing it in the bed, we'll do it in the toilet like usual. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd, that'd be really out of my depth, I think. <laughs> Seeing if someone can fuck the chip off your shoulder. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> the one chip, mate, is a whole bag of them <laughs> covered in gravy. Oh, my canes. <laughs> oh. Sex parties. We know, um, if imagine. you listen to our podcast, you might have heard this before, but there's a promoter in the Northwest who organises orgies. <laughs> That we both gig for on the way up. Um, and uh, not at the orgies. <laughs> no, no, no. But stage time, stage time. And uh, I was once at a gig and they said, how much do you charge in? He said, oh, what I do is I charge a fiver and that gets your nibbles as well. And <laughs> at the sex party? At the sex party. Yeah, no, they're not. What, what you're thinking of is not what they are. It's more just like a static caravan. <laughs> and a dairyly lunchable. Yeah, and a dairyly lunchable. <laughs> Kind of, <laughs> <ugh>. <laughs> a caravan? That's not a sex you know party, what? that's as, just him. <laughs> as a feminist, if you went there, no one would recognise you, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the way forward, <laughs> is go to only sex parties in caravans. Yes. <laughs> I'm really not that keen on sex, to be honest with you. I mean, I like it. Not enough to have a dairy lunchable. Oh, no. <laughs> Look, even I wouldn't eat a dairy lunchable, and that is saying something. No, absolutely not. No. No way. Well, this has digressed quickly, isn't it? I know. <laughs> um, so if you're listening at home, we should probably say what our podcasts are, because there will be people listening who perhaps 
didn't come because I thought, what's that? You can explain us. <laughs> We've got an intro. <laughs> do the introduction. Oh, d- oh yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're enablers. <laughs> and I resent it deeply. <laughs> oh, I'm excited. Welcome to this special crossover episode of Old Killer, No Feminism, with me, Rachel Fairbairn, Kiri Pritchard McLean, and Deborah Francis White. Just before we start, we'll do our usual disclaimer. We do this podcast because we have a mutual interest in serial killers, and as long as we are doing this podcast. It's so <laughs> Thank you. I did miss a bit out there, uh, and it shows. Yeah, you how fucked conf- your own introduction, mate. <laughs> it shows how confused by new words I am. That's fine. <laughs> oh, yes. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which... Undermine it. Yeah! There we go. Yeah. Smashed it, guys. Nice. Yeah. yeah, very nice. So uh, basically, we chat about murder. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. But, it? But, and everything but else. But today, feminist murder. Yeah, but well, I think murder is a feminist issue. <laughs> 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 Genuinely, I want to write a book called that, so put those... Ask the universe. Not that I believe in that shit. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think that murder is a, a feminist subject yeah. um, because w- usually women are the ones that get murdered. Yep. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, or blamed for people murdering. And also a lot of the rhetoric around true crime is really uh, sort of sensationalist and uh, mm-hmm. really sort of like, I would say it's women dying with their tits out. So it's all just really like, and grubby. Yeah. And we wanted a podcast that wasn't that and had a level of empathy to it. And I hope that's what we've made. Yeah, and also just to talk to each other, how women actually talk to each other. It's so yes. funny. American men too, just be like, you guys are outrageous. The way you speak to each other, like, that's how women speak when you're not around, motherfucker. <laughs> That's what's good about podcasts, isn't it? That men can listen in on how we talk when they're not there and they're not interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, what we had is our, our demographic, uh, the nature of true crime is it's lots of women. Um, so we had, like, our, it was probably 70, 30. And then we went on Richard Herring's podcast, which is pure sausage. Mm. Um, and it swung it back the other way. And loads of men, like, were very sweet, were, like, mm. started listening and were like, this is actually really good, girls. We're like, yeah, we know. <laughs> well um, done. But they were just... It was an interesting thing that hit. They had never sought out two women having a conversation. Can I just... Um pop something on the tape. This is a bit like me saying sex event now. I'm trying not to say anything like sex event. I'm trying not to say anything Alan partridge When you said, oh, it's usually women being killed, in fact, homicide victims are mostly male. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of female homicide victims, but I think serial killers almost exclusively seem to kill women. Mm. So homicide is sometimes just punching somebody or, you know, I'm going to kill you because you did this to me or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to revenge or something like that. But why do serial killers, is it a serial killing almost exclusively an act of misogyny? I think it varies. I think there's groups that are targeted. Mm. I would say sex workers, young girls, homeless people and gay guys, but uh, which are groups who are marginalised and not protected. So you can get away with killing more of them for longer. I think as well, while, while men are, you know, the highest level of murder victims... I think the way in which women are killed is much more aggressive. It's usually hateful. I mean, any killing and is aggressive, isn't y- it? Oh, really? yeah, when well, I know. Like, I, mean, yeah. I mean, like, there's Just usually... To... I mean, look at sort of domestic violence and stuff like that. It's usually... How do I explain this? Sort of a, an act mean. of... It's into a, a power dynamic, isn't yeah, it? It's yeah, a, it's an act of power, 100%, yeah. and, and control. And, uh, yeah, obviously, well, obviously any murder is, is bloody awful, let's be honest. <laughs> and She'll not say all. it. She'll say it. She doesn't care who's I'll listening. I'll tell you. <laughs> Murder's bloody awful. You heard it here first. I mean, Absolutely the, out of order. There, there will be more hot takes like this tonight. <laughs> um, friends, not as good as we thought it was in the 90s. <laughs> But it's all we had in those days, but we, we, no, before we had to think pieces on how awful Friends is, uh, well, we had I, friends. That's I was ahead had. of the curve with Friends, I hated it. And you know, yeah, do you know why? I thought every single character was an absolute piece of shit. <laughs> and I even thought this at a young age, I was like, why do people watch these awful people who do these horrible things that are meant to be funny? They were very the pretty. Yeah, but you know, still cunts though, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Horrible. If we weren't able to enjoy watching Pretty Cunts, what would be the point of having a television? <laughs> oh, wildlife documentaries, they're good. 
Some of them are pretty cunts. <laughs> you watch Attenborough, they're always after each other. Talk about aggressive structural violence that chimps and monkeys have, the female oh. monks, and then the actual violence that the male chimps and monkeys, I'm not sure which ones are which, to be honest with you, Simon. <laughs> Dangerous territory here, but, you know, it's very interesting. And a lot of nature, pretty cunts. Ch chimpanzee is my least favourite animal. They are. Chimpanzees are your least favourite animal. You know they're our closest relatives, aren't they? Not Is bothered. <laughs> I'm indifferent about chimps. I didn't realise I'd be asked at this tonight. Just I have no strong feelings. I'm a feminist, but... I have to admit, I was a bit behind the curve with all killer, no filler. Everyone was telling me it was brilliant and I just haven't got around to listening to it. And I always think, oh God, I don't listen to enough of other people's podcasts. And then when I came to do this crossover season, I thought, everyone's been saying how brilliant it is. I've got to listen to it. So I did what I always do if I'm listening to someone else's podcast for the first time and there's already like 100 episodes or whatever. I just scroll down and look for a guest that I might like. So for example, today I listened to David Mitchell on Rilla Histopa. And I was scrolling through and I was thinking, God, I don't know any of the names of these <laughs> guests. <laughs> and I thought, I thought, God, you know, it's really successful. It's, I'm surprised they've not got more famous people on. <laughs> I thought, I thought, well, maybe I'm just out of the loop with comedians. They probably are famous and I just don't know. You know, I didn't know half the people got nominated in Edinburgh this year. And then I saw, I saw like Fred West and I thought, I know his name. Um, I think these people might be murderers, not comedians. Honestly, it took me so long to work it out. I was like, oh. And do you know what I also thought? I judged you because I thought it's very male heavy. <laughs> I thought they don't have any female guests on. It's, they don't have any female guests at all. It is very male and white. So yeah, it's male. Very, very I was male like, oh, all these straight white comedians they booked. They booked. Where are all the women? You know, why have they not had Sophie Duker on or Olga Cock or Kemar Bob? Oh. Here's another straight white man. <laughs> but you have, and I, I do need to call that as a, you focus on a lot of straight white male serial killers. Is it because <laughs> it's hard to find you diversity? You work with what you've got. Well, it's hard it to find is. diversity. I mean... It's what they say about Mock the Week. It's hard to find the women. Well, actually, there are quite a few female serial killers, but they tend to be a group that we're not interested in. We're not a fan of a poisoner, no. are we? Boo. Don't we're not into poisoners. Very boring, a poisoner. And women Tedious. tend to poison. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's very common. That'll be most well, you, of them will poison. Well, you don't need the, a lot of upper body strength. Yeah. For arsenic. And it's sort of like, it's still in the kitchen, isn't it? So, <laughs> she's their domain. I don't go in there when she's cooking. So. <laughs> yeah, so it's a very sort of surreptitious way of doing it. Whereas men is, like, you know, lots of violent secretions. There's all kind, you know, it's quite high drama. Um, very so, messy. yeah, women are, are tend to be poisoners or um, are what they're called angels of death. Yeah. What's, Nurses. Yeah. 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 Or they're helping men, aren't they? It's like they're, yes. they're sort of in love with a man who's telling them yes. you know, yeah. he's got them in his spell. There's a fair few of those killer couples. Yeah. You can see it if you, if you watch, if you're a fan of Channel 5, I mean, every other program is about that over there. <laughs> is it wrong for me to say she's in his spell when she's been a proactive part of it? Is that essentially unfeminist that I'm saying, well, she doesn't have autonomy, and also <laughs> I'm giving him all the credit for the killing? Or is it. <laughs> or, is it also not okay to say, oh, she's just this little victim, you know, when she's actually killed teenagers or whatever? I think there's... A lot of time it's an abusive relationship, 100%. I mean, not that I'm justifying it. Myra Hindley, that was an abusive relationship. Yeah. Carla Homolka and Paul Bernardino, that was an abusive relationship. Yeah. And I think a lot of the time a woman is frightened of a man but also in awe of him and under his control, maybe? I think some people take the, it's better to be, what is it, the right hand of the devil than in his way. Mm. So I think there's some women who are genuinely frightened and are in a coercive, controlling relationship. And also, if they get them young as well, they romance the idea mm. of doing this ultimate act mm. of sacrifice together. But uh, when it comes down to it, like, you're still a human being. Like, loads of people have been in controlling relationships and don't go on to murder. Yeah. So I think that there's a certain amount of, like, uh, yeah. So, uh, again, another hot take. Um, <laughs> many, many people in this room may have been in a relationship they found controlling and yet have limited their homicide to yeah. Um, yeah. fewer than six people. <laughs> I was that fucking close, though, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's a really interesting thing that when it's couples, because it is is often a power. Di- I can't think of any couples where the woman has held the power in that situation. But, no. it is, but I, I'd say it's fairly equal when you get to Fred and Rose. I was going to say you get yeah. the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> One of Rachel's so top well. three. So yeah, Fred and Rose West definitely. I don't think there's a, there was any sort of imbalance of power there. I think they were both very much into what they were doing. Yeah. Um, she, I mean, it, she did sort of say that she was frightened of him, but years later, when the shit hit the farm. But I think you were saying something interesting to me the other day about this, that we are more fascinated as a society by women who kill because we expect women to be nurturers. Yes. So mm. we're always like, but how could she have? So we are actually... Uh, collectively more judgmental of a woman who can leave her caring and nurturing role, which she should really just be stroking a kitten while suckling mm. a newborn at all times. <laughs> Is this one of those things oh. in the penthouse with a mask? <laughs> <laughs> yes. But yeah, no, it's absolutely true that women tend to get, for violent crimes, get harsher sentencing Mm. because it's deemed to be basically moving away from the stereotype that you're a caregiver, you're a safe thing. It's also really dark in cases like Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. Myra Hindley was the reason that those children felt safe to get in that van Mm because, well, he's with a woman. Like, they know not to get in a van with a man, but with a woman there. So it's really dark. But there's the flip side of it in that when uh, they were caught, Myra Hindley wasn't arrested because they assumed, well, a woman could never be implicated. So she had five days to just destroy evidence mm. because they were like, well, it couldn't possibly be a woman because she was literally like, I was looking the other way while it was all happening, but she was just mm. as heavily implicated as him. And same with Fred and Rose. They bugged the house that she was in and that's the only way that they sort of got anywhere near realising that it was teamwork and not just him doing it all. I think it's interesting as well, you know, because obviously women aren't expected to murder. I mean, we, people don't like it when we, you know, voice displeasure at something or have an opinion, so they're certainly not going to like it when we actually kill somebody, which is a man's job. <laughs> so, so when you're a kid and you get told, like, you know, if you get lost in the supermarket or whatever, what my mum used to say to me was, always go to a, a woman, a lady, or mm. a woman with children, because you, you assume, like, they're yeah. decent people. They're not going to take you away and murder you, are they? And as we've established, it's not an absolutely safe bet, but it certainly is a safer bet. Yes. Mm. If you're, you, know, you have to tell your kids something. You can't say, if you get lost, just stand there. Yeah. And, <laughs> and panic. And like, you have to say, go towards Pets, a woman. don't get lost, you little fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> You've got one job in a supermarket, and it's not to get lost. <laughs> one job. That's what I would say. Babe, you may be in danger of raising a serial killer. Um, (laughs) Please put your hands together and give an enormous all-killer, no-feminism welcome to the incredible Rachel Fairburn! Oh, thank you very much. Oh, it feels really weird, like, doing that and then coming over here. I've got to do my actual job now. It feels bizarre. Uh, lovely. So, obviously, I'm very interested in true crime. I'm fascinated by serial killers, uh, which my friends find weird, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, you lot are interested in serial killers. And what fascinates me is why people serial kill. I say people, I mean men. Uh, now, obviously, I'm not getting a men. I absolutely love men. The amount of pregnancy scares I've had will attest to that. Uh, it is... And, of, of course, I, I love men. Some of my best friends are men. Uh, and it's, it's not, you know, it's not all men. It's not. It's not all men. Of course it is not all men, but it's not all dogs either, but some do bite and have to be dealt with. <laughs> now, what fascinates me about, I mean, like men, you do serial kill more than women, 100% you do. And women, we're not better than that because we do serial kill, as we were just chatting about before. Usually when we serial kill, though, it's with somebody else. Like, we're usually in love with them. We'll do anything to please them. It's like we're a bit, a bit brainwashed by them. Uh, it's actually the same set of circumstances that we do anal. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'll be honest with you, if I was with a bloke and he said, look, Rach, you've got two options tonight. Number one, I do you up the bum. Number two, we go out and kill a stranger. I'd be like, right, start the car. <laughs> I'll get a hammer and some bin liners. <laughs> Because that first one is not happening. <laughs> what fascinates me, though, genuinely about serial killers, it's like the trigger for why 
people serial kill. Just that one thing that happens. Like I was reading about Jeffrey Dahmer recently. Of course, you're familiar with Jeffrey Dahmer. He killed and mutilated a lot of young men in America in the 1990s. And the trigger for him, serial killing, was, it was when he was going through puberty. He had all these hormones going around his body. He discovered he was gay. He was dissecting animals at school and at home, which he shouldn't have been doing. <laughs> and he started to associate sexual pleasure with dissection. Now, I can relate to that. <laughs> Not that bit, obviously. <laughs> Just whatever you're into during puberty really does affect your sexual life later on. Now, for example, when I was going through puberty, I was obsessed, and still am, absolutely obsessed with Liam Gallagher. <laughs> and to this day, I can't orgasm unless somebody shouts, sunshine. <laughs> Lovely, I enjoyed that. Rachel Fer Welcome to the stage, the wonderful, the one, the only, Kerry Pritchard McLean! Hello. Also very interested in serial killers. Obsessed uh, with serial killers in particular because they're lacking in empathy. And that's what I find really fascinating. Um, I read loads. I would go down a rabbit hole every night. I'm on like Wikipedia reading about serial killers. And when I read about them, I get the same kind of response you get when you watch a really sort of scary film. I get like palpitations. I get quite scared. And I guess it's being stimulated. Not in a like Ted Bundy way, but like I... <laughs> Like, I, I'm sort of fascinated by it. But what's happened is, out in the real world, I have sort of mistaken that energy for the frisson of sexual chemistry. Um, yeah, I've met people, and, like, my body is clearly sending me, like, alarm signals, and I'm like, hello. <laughs> you know, I meet a guy with hollowed-out eyes. He's like, yeah, I'm an insomniac, and I live on my mum's basement. I'm like, tell me more, big boy. <laughs> it's shocking. I got so convinced that I was going to fuck a serial killer, right? I was absolutely convinced, I was like, this is how I'm going to die, that I would sort of like take it into account on nights out. So I was thought, right, if I pull a guy, we're going back to my house. Because, like, you want to be murdered in your own home, don't you? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like having the shits. You don't want it to happen, but if it's going to happen, you want it to be in your fucking bathroom, don't you? <laughs> I don't want to be murdered on his house. No way, I don't want to be chopped up on an Ikea rug that everybody's got. <laughs> no, I've got hardwood floors. <laughs> I, um, I became obsessed with the idea that uh, my partner was a, a serial killer. I'm not totally off the idea either. So there's quite a lot that stacks up about it. He can eat half a chocolate bar and put the other half in the fridge. <laughs> Fucking weird. He's got an estranged father. Ding, ding. <laughs> uh, when we got together, we'd have emotional conversations. He'd find them physically exhausting and need to sleep afterwards. <laughs> It's hard learning how other people feel, isn't it, darling? <laughs> and for the first 18 months that we were together, he was living in his dead mum's house. hey -o! <laughs> As a full house of serial killer bingo, isn't it? <laughs> but we're settled now. I think he's the one that I'm going to be with forever. I think, yeah, we're settled down, which means that um, uh, I think we're going to get married. We're talking about getting married. Uh, which means either I'll make an honest woman of me or a woman suit of me. <laughs> Either way, it's my big day. <laughs> my, my genuinely, my worst nightmare at the moment is that uh, he makes a woman suit of me and looks thinner in my skin than I do. <laughs> Thank you. We sort of broke it down into categories of things that we're quite interested about in relation to feminism and murder. Mm -hmm. um, so one is, uh, we talked about the women in couples, but also about how victims are treated in relation to sex workers in particular. Yeah. So if you particularly look at the Yorkshire Ripper as well, when he was committing his murders, he killed sex worker, sex worker, I think it was like four sex workers, and then he killed a girl who wasn't a sex worker and that was when the outrage started. And one of the comments, I think, was actually, is killed a decent girl now. And this is when it started to be taken seriously because sex workers, they just weren't thought of as, you know, 
actual people in a way. Yeah. Which just before we got here, um, Busman's Holiday, we were writing up a podcast on the Boston Strangler. Um, so you know, <laughs> so we're writing up, and, and it was a BBC article that said of it. Uh, they said uh, everyone was shocked by the Boston Strangler um, because he wasn't killing uh, sex workers and vagrants; he was uh, killing respectable women. And it's just such a really horrible thing that you see repeated over and over again: is that sex workers' lives are seen as disposable, and being murdered yeah. is seen as an occupational hazard. Yeah, which is why serial killers are allowed to get up to the numbers mm. because they're just seen as a disposable part of society. I even think as recently as the Ipswich Strangler, that was big news at the time, but I don't think it was as big or as important or reported as it should have been because the women were yeah. sex workers. It just felt a bit like, oh yeah, this bloke's murdered all these prostitutes. That's yeah. what it kind of felt like a little bit. It but wasn't... I think that's still the case now that in most conversations about that I think might take place about sex workers, not in the bubble that we're in, mm. but outside that bubble, there is a, a sense of exactly what you're saying. Well, it's an occupational hazard and somehow you're less than. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any examples of this? Or are you just talking sort have of Have I generic? killed any sex workers? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, one of the things I'm proudest of is we got a message a few months ago um, from a woman who runs a, 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 I don't know, a network that supports sex workers. She's a sex worker. And uh, there's a... I think they're based in Edinburgh, London and Leeds. Mm-hmm. And she sent us a most amazing message saying loads of women who are sex workers like true crime but won't engage with it because of the tone that's taken. Mm-hmm. And with them, like, you know, and it was, it, they, well, they'll call them prostitutes and, and fallen women and all yeah. this kind of stuff. And go, well, she was out, what does she expect? So they were saying that ours is the podcast that they listen to because they don't oh. feel like they're marginalised mm-hmm. and they feel like there's a more empathetic approach on it, which I was like, it's like genuinely, I was so mm-hmm. absolutely made up. And we did a collection, uh, um, we usually do collections for stuff at our shows. I can't remember, which, was it, it was a London one, wasn't it? Was it London, yeah. Like so we one. asked, because uh, I listened are really engaged and really empathetic as well I said to them what is useful for us to collect on your behalf because we've done it before with period poverty charities and things like that and she was like Johnny's and Lube and I was like I think they can cover this <laughs> um, and then so I mean I this... couldn't cover the Lube if you've been yeah. listening to <laughs> there's, a, there's an in joke there that we won't get into <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's quite a dry subject if you will there's Uh, my, my boyfriend's mum came to watch the live show we did in Edinburgh and somebody mentioned that incident and afterwards we went, went for lunch and we were in Hawksmoor having a steak and she went, what was that thing they were talking about that I'm not allowed to know about? I was like, let's just leave it. Eat your dinner, Julie. Shut up. <laughs> Um, so we did a collection of Johnny's. One of the women from the organisation came and collected them and they counted them up and there was over a thousand and the woman sent a message and she went, can you tell them thank you? Because it was like the biggest single donation. They've had to split them up between all three branches. There's been so much. And they said, and we're really pleased because um, they've got that extra safe funds, which are dearer. <laughs> <laughs> so you fucking spent the money, guys. Well done. <laughs> so it's just a really nice thing and it feels like something that we could, because we don't want to be, it's one of the reasons why we haven't done adverts because yeah. we don't want to be another organisation like profiting off yeah. dead girls because it, it doesn't mm. feel right to have adverts does it it just never felt the right well also thing. what's the be like um, and so and then he killed another sex worker the thing about diet chef <laughs> is you <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean it feels Mur- murdered in her own home in her own bed speaking of which Casper mattresses <laughs> <laughs> It just doesn't work, does it? I just, yeah, we no, never felt so, right. No, so, yeah, we, like, yeah. And so it's been a really great hearing from that community. And I'm not saying we've got it right all the time yeah. because we've been doing it four years and we've been of learning course, about yeah. terminology and how to speak about people and the best way to speak about people and to people. But I think that's something that I'm really proud of is yeah. our relationship that we have. So if anybody's got any condoms on them tonight or any lube, <laughs> please leave it in a basket at the door. <laughs> Oh, when we did a, a big venue in Salford, and we so there's an in joke that we have different um, not approaches. We have a, a different set of beliefs when it comes to anal sex. Um, and it, you say one thing once when you're hungover, and it it haunts you for three years now. You have it shouted at you in the street. It's your aha. That's what it is. Aha. <laughs> 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 so, 
so Rachel was scolding me because I, I, I had a long term partner and I hadn't had anal sex with them. And then she was like, oh, fucking grow up, whack it in. Um, <laughs> and I was like, you've got to have a conversation about it. And she's like, it's not a fucking holiday. And she was really sort of telling me off. And then she was sort of saying, just chuck it in. And I was like, well, what about lube and stuff? And she's like, no, fuck it. So one of the things we did is we bought for our audiences, we're trying sort of where we can do little presents. We brought sachets of lube and we put a sticker on it with hashtag dry bumming. Um, <laughs> And then we did a big sort of like council theatre with every person on the brilliant as they are, every member of staff was, I'd say, pushing 80. And we had to sort of hand them a box of lube and be like, um, can you just hand these out? And these poor sort of women being like, <laughs> I've been told to give you one of these. <laughs> Um, but they were brilliant about it. They yeah. were lovely, but it didn't feel like our finest hour, no, did it? No. <laughs> no, I mean, I wasn't happy about any of it, to be quite honest with you. The stickers, the lube, the elderly women having to get involved. Uh, yeah. So tell us about a serial killer. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you want to do? do you wanna, should we talk about Tilly Clemenc? Yeah, you're... you're might rate, uh, might, uh, so Tilly Clemenc, we talked about this before on the podcast, but she uh, was... Uh, too ugly to live. So there's, she existed in Chicago at the time that Chicago, the musical is set, where everyone was just fucking killing each other all the time. The murder rate was ridiculously mm-hmm. high and it was huge. And just like it happens in the musical, it was really big. There was media storms around it. Yeah, and they were always was- trying to catch, like, which lovely ma- murderess is up next? Yeah, there was a lot of women murdering their partners. And yeah, it was, it was rife. Halcyon yeah. days. And... Uh, <laughs> Tilly Clemac, who did she murder? Did she murder her? Well, I think it was her partner, wasn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. kind of one of those. It's one of those episodes that's not really stuck in my head. I'm ever so sorry. But when she was on trial, there was actual comments about her physical appearance. Yeah, and all because up until then they had been quite beautiful waifs, like being like just like Roxy Hart being like, oh, and I didn't even know, and I just shot him, and it was a crime of passion. I don't even remember doing it. Um, but Tilly Clement was like, yeah, I did it. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, was like, poisoned them with rat poison. And because she looked like me, they were like, yeah, we're not going to let you live. So she was one of the first women to be found guilty of murder, even though she was sort of less ostensibly guilty mm. than the others. And, you know, because there was this whole thing, of, which often happens with poison, is like, was it actually that she just wasn't washing her teacups properly? Um, which feels like a slight in another way, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> sure is. Well, yeah. Mm. I've heard she uh, doesn't wash her teacups. <laughs> <laughs> Would you you rather go down being thought to be evil but at least deliberately unsanitary or (laughs) just a bit unhygienic and judged by the women? Oh, I think go down in flames. Go down in flames, yeah. Yeah, go down as a murderer rather than, you know, a slut in the old-fashioned sense of the world. A slattern. Slattern. As they used to say. Yeah, Yeah. but in slut that as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I'm adding another terrible word. Okay, good. Uh, Good. Let's throw them around. So, yeah. When when you say she looked like you, you're very hot. What are you talking about? Sure. I know how to 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 upsell what I've got. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) But if you say, I mean... I don't imagine she rocked up to the court like this. I was going to (laughs) say... If she walked in like this, just, you know, the gun, the gun, the gun, the gun, the gun that's you. For the gun. This is literally razzle-dazzle, what it I've got is. on. It but is. she was kind of unapologetic, was, was sort of like bigger in her frame, didn't want to dress up, because they were told to like soften your appearance mm. and change your mm. hair and look a bit like they did with, uh, jumping into another crime here, uh, with O.J. Simpson's attorney in mm. the case that they were like, you're too smart, uh, you're, you're an educated woman, your features seem harsh. You need to soften yourself up. And like when there is a guy who is clearly guilty, mm. sue me. Uh, clearly guilty. They put all the pressure on his attorney to change sure, her to, appearance, to, yeah. so she was more likable. She got that fucking awful perm. Okay. Oh. I'm going to throw a hot take on the table now. Is it a female privilege that we can soften our appearance and look vulnerable and get away with more? No, because the male equivalent of that is when they put a suit on. <laughs> <laughs> It is, isn't it? When you see Ted Bundy, like, you know, like when he's, you know, not all grizzled and stuff and he's suddenly got a suit on, that was a big part of it. They were like, God, well, he looks great and he's very clean cut and it mm. doesn't seem like something he would do. It's true, but I'm still going to put it out there. I still think it's a female privilege. I'm going to put it out there further. It's a white woman privilege. Uh, yes. That white women can cry and get away with stuff. 
one time I was running through a music festival and I had to get to a gig inside the festival and it was one of those ones where it was, you know, I'd been sent the wrong way and blah, blah, blah. Wasn't my fault, guys. Let Classic the white jury, woman stuff. Let the jury... <laughs> let the jury... It wasn't my fault. But when I got to a certain point, I was coming around, a man said, you have to go to the back because we're checking all the bags. And I thought, well, if I get my bag checked and stand in that half-hour queue, I am going to miss the gig. And I was frustrated. I was hot. I'd hate running around at festivals. I just, you know, I found all of that camping, not that I was camping, don't be ridiculous, but <laughs> the, I, the other people were, and it <laughs> makes me feel exhausted. And <laughs> there are tents in my peripheral, and I just was like, exhausted, there's nowhere to sit, all of that. Anyway, so I, I was feeling close to tears, but I strategically probably, if I'm completely honest with you, let them out. And the man looked at me, went, oh, all right, just go through, just go through. And I was meeting another comedian who was a woman of colour and we were talking about it and I said I feel really bad about her because I know that it is white female privilege and she went oh yeah, yeah yeah I would have been sent to the back and I said and imagine if that was an Asian or a Middle Eastern man I mean he would have been searched twice if he'd started mm. to try and get out of the search and we were talking about that imagine if that was a black man it was only then that I realised a friend had asked me to bring their recreational substances oh. <laughs> in my backpack not mine because I don't wouldn't but, I ha you know, and I went, oh, fuck. Like, I've just realised these are in the bag. And I just sort of thought, yeah, the best mule is a white woman who doesn't know she's carrying. <laughs> it's true. I didn't know to look nervous. I could just look vulnerable. So I really do, I think, especially where this intersects with race. Uh, but even I would say white women over white men, if we do a cry, we can get away with more stuff. And I just want to start acknowledging where female privilege is because I think it really helps men to acknowledge their privilege when they have it. Because I think men, well, men do have a lot more privilege a lot of the time, but where it intersects, sometimes not. I think white women have got a lot of privilege that we don't acknowledge. Mm. That should really get a round of applause, actually. <laughs> oh, what's this? Question time. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think if you're a white woman, you should be clapping. That's all I'm going to say. I feel on sort of the appearing vulnerable, like using vulnerability as like to get away with things and stuff like that. I feel that a lot of people make the assumption about me because I'm small and without makeup, I look about 12. <laughs> I seem to spend my entire life being a certain way so people don't assume that I'm vulnerable. Does that mm. make sense? Like, the amount of times, if I've not got makeup on and I've got flat shoes on, people just... Look, revolving doors don't even know that I exist in that scenario. Mm. So some people just totally overlook me. And I think people think that I'm very sensitive because I'm small and young-looking-ish. Mm. Do, you, do you know what I mean? So well, that's the other I, side of the coin, is when you want to be taken seriously, sometimes you're not. Yeah. I'm not saying being seen as vulnerable is always useful, Many times in the boardroom, it's not a privilege, but in the courtroom, mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could definitely get away with a murder, is basically what I'm saying. <laughs> it, unless you had a drink Me. in you. Oh. And then they'd be like, oh, we see what's happened here. <laughs> yeah. I, I, could no, I wouldn't even raise my voice, let alone strangle somebody with my own hands. <laughs> and then two beers later, oh, it's a fucking cunt anyway. <laughs> 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 and I'd do it again <laughs> and again he had a garment he had a garment <laughs> yeah I hadn't thought about I mean that's classic isn't it I hadn't thought about the like racial implication of that and I guess it is yeah a mm. white lady privilege to be like I'll just make my hair look nice which is what mm. literally happens in the film is they dye her hair blonde and make it all nice and then she bats her eyelids and she gets let off and the one when they do the cell block tango the one that doesn't get let off is the only one who can't speak English yes um, and which, she's an immigrant yeah and which, she's the innocent one exactly she's the only really. innocent one and Tilly Klemek was a Polish immigrant as well mm. so there was a big division anyway yeah. in the Polish community in Chicago it's interesting how often appearance is discussed when women are either murdered or on trial for a murder. When someone's young, white, pretty, it's deemed more of a tragedy, yeah. isn't it? Mm. It's reported as more of a tragedy. Especially if you think about things, and then how things are overshadowed. So when Meredith Kircher mm. was murdered, Amanda Knox was on trial, people totally forgot about the victim there, and it was all, oh, Foxy Knoxy. Because mm. a woman who happened to be attractive was accused of committing a murder. I remember that being so distasteful and yeah. so far from what should be reported. They did it with Joanna Dennehy as well, who's yeah. a very recent serial killer and a woman. 
they were like, whoa, sexy angel of death. And she's like, no, she's just going around stabbing people. And she was a fugitive for a while. Mm. And they're like, whoa, size eight though. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> So this woman who you were talking about, sorry, I forgot her Tilly. name. Tilly. So sorry, Tilly. I should have remembered your name. How many people did she kill? Three, I think. Yeah, I think it's three. three. What poison. motivated her? I think she is one of the 1% uh, that kills for convenience. Mm. So I think that she had just got fucked off and was like, see ya. Um, convenient? Yeah, that's my favourite. When favorite is it convenient time. to kill oh. anybody? I'll be on. always inconvenient. You've got to get rid of the body. That's so much more inconvenient. I- than just putting up with them. I, w- I don't think I should say this, but I'm, I'm going to. I, I w- don't worry, yeah. it's recorded forever, Rachel. So. <laughs> I, I, I can that our of... sex thing hasn't followed you around at all. Our <laughs> <Arse> sex. <laughs> you can have our sex at my sex event. <laughs> it is, that is partridge as well, our sex. <laughs> I, I can understand when, people, when women kill for convenience because the amount of times in my life that I just go, Oh, that person could just die. I would find things a lot easier. And it's, it's a horrible it, way to think, and I wouldn't do it, but, but I understand. The, the, body, the strength you need to get rid of a body, though, it's so... I've seen Breaking Bad, it's a lot. You have to put them in a bath of acid or something if you can't bury them outside. Like, how would I get rid of the body? I think Birkenhair started as convenience killers. Mm. Basically, someone hadn't paid their rent, and they were like, let's just kill them, and then sold their cadavers, which was... Easier. Oh, what year was Because they were this? like, they're never going to... Uh, it was a while ago now, when, that, when the bloody law came in. In Edinburgh, ages ago, when there were still horses knocking around. Like the 1800s? <laughs> yeah. yeah. 18... When you could sell a cadaver to a doctor? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah Dr. Yeah. Robert Peel is who they were selling it to. Um, what, I, the man that Bobby's are named after? No, 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 you, Robert oh, Knox. Could, Robert you just, Knox, You whoops. just... Um, uh, <laughs> Mixed up my academics. Um, <laughs> Robert Knox, yeah, they were selling okay. to, who was a surgeon who was like really famous because Edinburgh was leading in medicine and because they had right. this fresh supply of bodies coming from <gasps> somewhere. Um, people think they're grave robbers, but they weren't. But they wow. started off killing for convenience. Yeah. Robert was the one who knocks. Nice. Hashtag breaking bad. See how I've linked those two ideas seamlessly. <laughs> <laughs> It's not good when you have to explain how clever your joke was. But sometimes <laughs> it's necessary, sometimes it's necessary. And there's also a few killers uh, that we've looked at. So I think Elizabeth Bathory mm-hmm. and Delphine Laurie, although Delphine, I'd say, is on the fence. But they've been very powerful women. And I think some of the rumours around them, these are historical cases as well, were based in unseating a powerful mm. businesswoman. So Elizabeth Bathory, she owned you know, like so much land and things. And So revisionists say that she was... a carrying out sort of basic medical stuff, whatever mm-hmm. that word is. Um, you, Procedures. There we go. Um, so, you know, like peasant girls, if they got pregnant, they would need abortions, otherwise they'd be sort of cast out, and she was apparently was sort of carrying them out. So that's what revisionists say, that she wasn't actually torturing people and bathing in their blood, is that all those sort of, like, chopped-up women, they would, she was just doing them a favour. <laughs> um, well, although, uh, to just defend her for a second... Maybe she was trying hard to give them an abortion because that's what they needed and wanted and it wasn't legal. And then it went wrong and then she had to get rid of the body. Like, because I can see that happening. If someone bled out and then you think, oh God, now I'm going to go down. Yeah. You might. Mm. No, you wouldn't bathe in their blood. No, that does that, feel like... That's that a, tips her into the other side, that, doesn't it? That's in, the, <laughs> that's in the cons column. But what's really interesting is that bathing in blood thing is picked up in all kinds of folklore, so that feels like a thing that was added on top yeah. to make it more I, sensationalist. sensationalist. Yeah. I think as well with people like Bathory and Delphine LaLaurie, I think it's interesting because it shows how sort of gossip around women tends to stick and sort of informs people's opinions of them mm, for sex. years and years and years, mm. to, years. <laughs> to come. have questions from the audience because yes. we've got nine can minutes to go. Can I ask you one really quickly? Oh yes please. Because I think that everyone is interested in at least one serial killer. Is there anyone that has ever taken your eyes interesting? Well. That you've read up about? When I was a child I genuinely thought that a serial killer was <laughs> somebody who'd killed so many people they got their own television series. Like <laughs> as fictitiously like they would Not make Lightman's. a biopic about you sort of thing <laughs> that they would make a tv series about you and so it took me years to work out the serial killer was someone who'd killed uh lots of different people but uh, yeah i suppose 
Jack the Ripper, I did the tour with my uh, sister who came over. And when I found my biological, I found three biological sisters. One of them came over to London and wanted to go on the Jack the Ripper tour. And she said, when I was a kid, I thought I was Jack the Ripper. <laughs> and I had this whole thing that in another life I'd been Jack the Ripper. And I was like, that's, so normally it's something like Cleopatra. <laughs> and she was like, no, I wasn't fascinated with him. And my birth mother, Mel's mum said, yeah, yeah, she genuinely thought she was Jack the Ripper and was obsessed with Jack the Ripper, so she, we couldn't wait to go on the tour. Um, she couldn't, and so I was like, oh. Oh, the memories. Um, so she wore a memories. top hat and everything, I really get into it. <laughs> that, so she, she, did not, she was a bit disappointed by the tour, in fact, because actually it's just trailing around the East End. Going, that building's not there anymore, but it's sort of here. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. But I suppose the fact that that was, we don't know who that was, and that person went to the grave with that secret and there's so much mystery about who it was and so you know every now and again it comes out that there's someone says it's a painter or it was queen victoria herself or yeah. you know <laughs> something absolutely ludicrous so i suppose yeah jack the ripper is the one that i think because it's also in that victorian fog mm. and i think anything that's too recent i find too disturbing yeah and i think there's a distance on that it's in that oliver twist umbrella where you can look at sadness because there's just enough mm. years, it feels different enough. Do you have any insight as to who Jack the Ripper was? We hate Jack the Ripper. We hate it. Yeah, he's our worst. It's our least favourite one. Because we like the psychology, and you don't know the psychology, except it's an arrogant man. Yeah. yeah. So it's like the least... Could have been Queen Victoria. Yeah, well, that's an Alan Moore graphic novel, that, that's really <laughs> taken flight. Yeah. Um, it was his, because Queen Victoria's physician, isn't it? That, yeah. Because Albert was in a relationship with one of the women. There's a brilliant book, actually, called Five, that, I'm, that is on my Christmas list, about the women who were definitely killed by Jack the Ripper. And it's basically that we've assumed that they're sex workers and that I think only one was. It was just a sort of a sensationalist thing in the paper. So do seek that out. Any questions before we go? Raise a hat. Oh, goes a few. Oh. Oh. Prince Andrew. <laughs> uh. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. Yeah, I think so. Any other questions? Cool. If you could combine Doctor Who and Mindhunter, which murder would you investigate? John Bonet Ramsey. Yeah. She shouldn't cheer like that, but that's fine. <laughs> Yeah, I think we all have a, a sneaking suspicion who it is. Um, uh, but it would be good to have definitive proof because there's still a little girl who's dead yeah. and there's a lot of tragedy around that family and it would be nice if someone was uh, brought to justice and even with a more understanding eye, seeing who it was and how their circumstances can occur. John George Haig, love the clothes. <laughs> Very into his clothes as well, oh, isn't yeah. he? Dapper. Yeah. Well, yeah, John George Haig's, yeah. And there's someone in the front row? Absolutely not. I want a sauna. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Well, now I feel like a cunt. <laughs> if you didn't hear it, she said, well, I've always wanted to know who killed Madeleine McCann. I'm like, <laughs> oh. that sauna looks a lot more distasteful now, doesn't it? <laughs> Rachel? Nope. I don't think it's my responsibility. I think it's the responsibility of the police force. I, I would just like a nice house and a couple of nice dogs. I don't think you need to waste a wish on dogs. Just get dogs oh, no, from right, Bassey. Oh, yeah, the dogs will... Dogs home. Well, at first I'd do that thing where you wish for more wishes, but I know you're not allowed to do that, so I'd wish that you can wish that. And then I'd wish for a disclaimer. <laughs> I'd wish for a disclaimer before each wish that someone goes, are you sure you want that? And I go, yes or no. I'd have a system, I'd be happy. I would wish, for one of my wishes, that all crimes that were uh, violent and were currently hidden would come to light and be brought to justice. And in that one wish, I would have solved all of your problems. I would have saved Kiri. She can have a sauna. <laughs> Old house and dogs over here, because I've just covered it. And the other two, one would involve a dinner with John Hamm. <laughs> It would be like a long... No, fuck it, it's a wish. A long weekend. Uh, 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 after that, if he doesn't want to be with me, let him go. If he comes back, he's mine. If he doesn't, he never was. Um, 
just but a long weekend is enough time for him to sort of maybe actually did us better because it's harder to I'm so aware un-impress. that we're going over and this has only just started this fantasy <laughs> <laughs> It, it's, it's red now, isn't it's it? It's easier to reveal your flaws over a long weekend, isn't it? So just a dinner. Because uh, then that's, you know, one step in. And then the third wish would be uh, equality for the genders. And, yeah, because, I mean, it wouldn't... Still a sauna for me, actually. <laughs> um, th- thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. It's really nice of you. Kiri and I... Are going to be back here next yes. week uh, on Sunday, the eighth of September at midday. Uh, I'll, I'll do a show called a musical. That's all. The, yeah, it's the best. We start doing a podcast. It's the most fun ever, and we're doing a live one here at twelve o'clock uh, on the eighth of September with uh, Deborah Francis White as our brilliant guest. So come back and it's, enjoy it's that. It's the podcast, isn't it? That we're yeah, doing. yeah, yeah. So we're talking about musicals. We're talking about musicals, and I mean there is a piano present. So let's see what happens. So, so I can prep a song or four. You can, yes, Great. absolutely. So please come and buy tickets for that because this is. Really, I feel like nobody cares about me the way a musical cares about me. They <laughs> make all my dreams come true. Rachel, have you got anything to plug? Uh, next Sunday, I will be attending a local dog show near my friend's house uh, in, in Lewisham. So that's right. where I'll be. Um, can I just say thank you so much to Kieran and Rachel for agreeing to do this uh, when we phoned up and said. Okay, thank you so much. Do follow us at, at Deborah FW at Guilt Fem Pod. Kiri Pritchard MC on Twitter. You can find it. You can use Google. At Rachel Fairburn. Thank you so much. Take it over King's Place. You've been great. <laughs> Kiri Pritchard McLean, everybody. Rachel Fairburn, everybody. I've been Deborah Francis White. You've been great. Thank you so much. That's our show. You have been listening to All Killer No Feminism with Rachel Fairburn, Kiri Pritchard McLean, and me, Deborah Francis White. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. The producer was Tom Zielinski for the Spontaneity Shop. Music was by Mark Hodge. Thanks to Zoe, Sally and everyone at King's Place, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about All Killer No Filler, go to kiripritchardmclean.co.uk. And for more information about The Guilty Feminist and our podcast crossover season, go to guiltyfeminist.com. This is a special crossover episode of All Killer No Filler podcast and... Oh, fuck, I fucked it. Right. <laughs> Stop looking at me, you're making me embarrassed. (laughs) (laughs) I've written this down.